Okay, so tonight uh, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 26 through to verse 31. Um, and I'll just uh, read those for you. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery <coughs> indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, I do feel a little bit, um, not that I'm blaming Matthew, but I do feel I've been left holding the short straw uh, somewhat tonight because these are very difficult verses to read. And as soon as you start to expound them, I think some people get very nervous yeah. and, uh, and and a little bit panicky and so I want to go fairly slowly through this so that I'm not kind of leaving anyone behind uh, and leaving you with a wrong impression. Um, we're going to be looking tonight at some theological positions so hopefully you won't glaze over too much uh, and then in the sort of second half of this if you like tonight we're going to be bringing out the scriptures that explain what these verses really are, are, are saying. So we are going to be looking tonight at Calvinism and Arminianism. There you are, I said it. Um, and it's important to understand how those two different positions view these passages. Um, obviously, uh, this since this church is a... Is a uh, uh, Wesleyan Arminian Church, and if you didn't know that, a few seconds to recover from the shock. Uh, so therefore that is the position I will be putting forward because I believe that's the correct understanding of these verses. Um, there's two terms as well as Calvinism and Arminianism which you may or may not have heard. One is monogism and the other is synergism. Um, just explained briefly, uh, and these views kind of extend beyond theology beyond beyond Christianity and religion. Uh, synergism means uh, the interaction of two things to produce a combined effect. So that's the simplest translation, a simplest interpretation of it. Uh, monogism, as you might guess, simply means the action of one thing. Uh, I don't like the terms, I've got to be honest with you, because I think that uh, they, they have a shortfall and, and we'll look a little bit about at that as we go through tonight. Um, so first of all, let's just sum up the verses that we just read. Uh, firstly, in verse 26, it teaches us that there is no more uh, sacrifice for sins available uh, to this these particular people or person. Secondly, uh, that the punishment will be worse than punishment under the law, in verse 29. Uh, that this judgment and fiery indignation, verse 27, uh, will be from the Lord and that the Lord shall judge his people, uh, verse 30. So, um, the questions that are in most people's <coughs> minds when they read this is, or are, uh, is this dealing with Christians? And if it is, what are the circumstances in which such judgment would occur? And, and, and it, it leads us to this ultimate question, can uh, a Christian lose their salvation? That's really what, what we, can, we could sum it up as saying. Um, 
Now, the two theological groups that I spoke about uh, here, you can actually split it into three different theological groups, possibly even more. Um, and uh, uh, there are two positions that get lumped together, but they are subtly different um, in the reasons uh, uh, they have for, for uh, they, they basically say, no, a Christian can't lose their salvation. Uh, and they have two, two slightly different reasons for saying no. Um, this position is generally termed eternal security. You might have heard that. Um, that, that basically, as the, the phrase suggests, that your eternity is absolutely secure. Once you become a Christian, that's it. Uh, no need to worry. Uh, now, the two positions are the Calvinist position, which is known as perseverance of the saints. It's the P in tulip that Calvinism breaks into five points uh, and and what do you call that acrostic so like for each doctrine there is a letter T U L I P we won't go through them now but P is perseverance of the saints and 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 that doctrine that theology teaches that if you're a Christian you will persevere you will you will continue to the end and you'll you'll be with God in heaven no need to worry the other position which sometimes gets confused, is known as once saved, always saved, or for short, OSAS. Uh, what's the difference? Well, the Calvinist believes that you have been chosen from before the foundation of the world. You are unconditionally elect, therefore you will, you will uh, persevere, and therefore you'll be with God in heaven. You can't lose that. The OSAS position uh, uh, can have elements of, of, of kind of, well, you know, I was a sinner and I was lost, but then I believed on Jesus, I received him, and now I can't lose it. So there's like a subtle difference there, um, but, but that is, is basically the position that says, no, you can't um, lose it. Uh, the Arminian position that we as a, as a fellowship tend to represent is different to that. And um, remember I said at the beginning, these two terms, monogism and synergism, and why I didn't like them. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quote now. Um, this is a quote by someone called Ben Henshaw, who's a writer for the Society of Evangelical Arminians. So I guess he knows what Arminians believe. And so he's going to put forth the Arminian position. Now, Arminians believe... Uh, largely in synergism, if you want to use that term. Calvinists believe in, in monogism, but I'm going to show you why I've got a bit of a problem with those terms. He's, this is what he says. Arminian theology, when rightly understood, teaches that salvation is monogistic. God alone does the saving. God alone regenerates the soul that is dead in sin. God alone forgives and justifies on the merits of Christ's blood. God alone makes us holy and righteous. In all of these ways, salvation is entirely monogistic. The difference between Calvinism and Arminianism is whether or not God's saving work is conditional or unconditional. And, and, and that's what I want to emphasise tonight. It's that idea... Of, of my status in Christ as a Christian, is that completely unconditional or are there conditions or a condition attached uh, to it? He goes on to say, faith may be understood as synergistic only in the sense that God graciously enables us to believe, but we are the ones who must decide whether or not we will believe. So that is the position that, that I would say the Bible uh, teaches. Again, monogism, not a very good phrase, I don't think, because, you know, to be truly strictly monogistic, uh, it would have, if God is doing the saving, it would have to be God who's doing the believing as well. And that is just absurd. We know that we believe. So, so neither of those terms is very helpful, but you'll encounter them quite a few times. Uh, so yes, the, the, the key here, the real crux of the matter is whether uh, our salvation, whether our place in Christ is conditional 
or unconditional. So let's have a look at uh, some scriptures um, which which may or may not uh, prove whether our position is uh, whether our position in Christ is conditional or unconditional. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow me, John chapter ten. I'm going to bring out quite a few scriptures now. So John 10. John 10, uh, 27, and it's Jesus speaking. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Again, you will see that verse quoted quite often um, by, by people who say, you know, you, you cannot lose your salvation because no one can pluck you out of, uh, um, out of God's hand. So uh, let's have a look at uh, John 3. Just a little bit earlier on. These are all in John. John 3. John 3 and verse 36. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there you are. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting uh, life. So um, the, the, the third and, and final one I want to bring to you is John 14. John 14 and verse 23. <coughs> Um, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So, the argument goes, well, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, you would not stop loving Christ. Therefore, uh, the Father and Christ himself will come and make their abode with you. So therefore, you know, you're not... So those three together put forth the argument that you cannot lose your salvation. Again, I don't really like the term lose your salvation uh, because it sounds almost accidental, doesn't it? You know, uh, sure, I had it a minute ago, like losing your car keys or something, you know. Now, where, where do they put them? This idea of turning around, suddenly it's not there. I don't believe that that is what these verses in Hebrews 10 represent at all. Uh, this sudden accidental losing of salvation. And I want to just ask a few, three questions, rhetorical questions concerning those verses that we ju just looked at. Do you remember in John 10, 27, 28, about plucking them out of God's hand, that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice I know them and they follow me. So the question would be, what about if a Christian stopped following Christ? Would those, those promises still apply? Could you still apply them if the, if the Christian is no longer following Christ? Secondly, it was he that believeth on the Son in John 3.36. That that. It was the one who was believing on the Son. What if I stop believing on the Son? And remember, it's not just believing in, but it is believing on. It is putting my trust in its present continuous. What if I stop that? What if I stop believing on Christ and stop believing and trusting uh, uh, in him? And the last one, um, it said uh, that, that God will abide with me um, if I if I loved him, yeah, if a man loved me, he will keep my words. 
So, so surely a Christian, if they're a genuine Christian, will continue to love Christ and therefore he, he, he's not going to you know, depart from that Christian. Well, let's just have a look at Revelation chapter 2. Now we'll come back in a minute and we'll deal with the actual verses in Hebrews. But this is just really, I think it's important to do this. Revelation 2. And uh, this is the letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Revelation 2. One says unto the, the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So this is Christ and Christ is, is speaking. <coughs> Verse 2 says, I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast laboured and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast, le hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of, this, out of his place, except thou repent. So, whatever we think that, that means... <laughs> It seems that a, a Christian or a church can stop loving Christ or, or he, he, he in some way is no longer first in their affections and therefore the call is one of repentance. You must repent and be restored to that. So, so all the way through here, these seem to me to be conditional. They're conditional, they're on condition of following Christ uh, my security is on condition of believing on Christ. My condition uh, of security is by continuing to love Christ. And so uh, I don't see it as being, you know, you, you, you said a prayer, you were born again, you're in, mate. Don't, you know, don't worry about anything else. Live how you want. Your name's down. You've got your ticket to heaven. And away you go. And now I know not all Calvinists see it like that, you know, but but some do, you know. And I think that is is this these verses speak very much against that. So let's go back to the, the verses we're looking at in Hebrews ten, Hebrews chapter ten, and verse uh, verse twenty six, and it starts off for if we sin willfully. After we've received the knowledge of the truth. Again, you know, the Bible says that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. I would say that is synonymous with salvation. Uh, but what about this sinning willfully? You might say, well, isn't all sin willful? Um, let, let's, let's have a look at James 1. James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So... This is talking about a person who is drawn away of his own flesh, if you like. Uh, in, in a moment of weakness, he is enticed. Uh, uh, the idea of enticement, I guess it, it would be one of um, being, being tricked almost, uh, being drawn into something uh, uh, kind of quite despite oneself and, and and so it's this enticement this drawing away uh, and then coming to a point where your flesh just you know you, you, you 
it just overcomes you and you end up committing the sin. And that would seem to be, um, uh, there's, a, there's a progression or a digression here, isn't there, where, um, where, where the, the lust conceives and then it brings forth sin and then, then you get the death. So, so it's, it's this sort of sliding scale, if you like. Now, willful sin, and, I, and I'm, in this context of Hebrews 10, I think it is basically saying the person makes a decision of their own free will and says, I'm not following Jesus anymore. You know, and, and I, can you see the difference? You know, I've had enough of this for whatever reason. I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. I mean, it could be it's too hard. You know, I've got no friends or whatever the reason. But, but it's like, I'm not following Jesus anymore. Uh, I'm not going to believe on him. Um, I'm not going to follow him. And, and I'm not going to love him anymore. I'm just going to do my thing that I want to do. And what that is called uh, in theological terms is apostasy. You apostatize. You, you, you. It is the deliberate, conscious, and willing rejection of Christ. That really is what apostasy is, or, or of God. Uh, the term is sometimes misused to <laughs> suggest a rejection of a religious group or organization. That's not what it means. It is the, the deliberate rejection of God himself or of Christ um, um, himself. Uh, and, and it shows that of my own free will, I can apostatize or I can draw back, as it says uh, in, verse, in verse 38. And uh, this is the rejection of Christ as, our, as my Lord and Saviour. It's not me being overcome in a moment by my own flesh in a moment of weakness maybe i'm ill maybe i'm you know not feeling well and uh, 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 and i'm irritable and in that moment i lose my temper or you know there could be many scenarios we could we could draw upon that's not what it's talking about it's not talking about oh i, I sinned has does that mean i've lost my salvation does that mean god's <laughs> finished with me or i'm struggling with a besetting sin you know, you get that thing where Satan always hits you in the same spot every time. You can cope with most things apart from this one or this, these two things. And whenever he hits you in that place, it's like, oh, I just know I'm going to fall. You know, it's going to be hard for me. Uh, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? Well, no, the, the, it, it is talking about the deliberate apostasy, the deliberate, I'm not following Christ anymore. So I hope that makes that uh, clear. Now, one of the questions that is often asked or one of the statements that is often made is that, well, perhaps then such people who fall away from Christ were never Christians in the first place. And that, that would be a, the monogistic, the Calvinist position. That's what they would state. Um, I want to challenge that tonight uh, with one of the verses that's found in this um, passage it's uh, obviously Hebrews 10 and, um, and verse 29, which is really the meat of it, I suppose. And I'll read that to you. It says, Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall be he thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done gr uh, despite unto the spirit of grace. So two things I want to talk about there. Um, firstly, the covenant it's talking about is clearly the new covenant because it is compared in verse 28 with the Mosaic covenant, with the old covenant through Moses. Because it says, well, he that was despised Moses law, da 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 but under this covenant, how much more or how much sorer punishment will there be? So it's clear that it's talking about the new covenant. Secondly, it says, it talks about the person who hath counted the blood of the covenant, that's of the new covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. So it is clear from that verse, according to this verse, the person was sanctified by the blood of Christ. Now, for the Calvinist position which believes in a limited atonement, believes that Jesus only died for Christians. He only died for the unconditionally elect 
I don't really know how you would sidestep that and say this person is not a Christian because according to the passage, he was sanctified by the blood of Christ, this, this individual or persons that are being mentioned here. So that's why, yes, I believe that it is uh, concerning believers. It is concerning those believers, those Christians who quite deliberately apostatize from Christ. That is the meaning and, and it is that narrow I'm going to say it is not referring to anything else, but it is referring to that. That is my understanding um, of it. And, you know, people say, well, you know, do you think do you think it could have been me? Do you think I could have done that? Do you think? And they worry about it, you know. Um, and I think there may be two classes of people here. And I don't wish to be uncharitable, but I think some people genuinely are worried about it and it's probably down to not really understanding what the verses mean and I hope I've clarified tonight what they mean but then I do wonder whether some people are continuing in sin uh, and uh, want the reassurance that it's okay for them to do that and there won't be any consequences and I'm afraid I can't give that guarantee and you know what's the answer well Peter says it in 2 Peter 1.11. He says, Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. In other words, don't forget what Christ has, <coughs> has done for you. That's the context. Don't forget what Christ has done for you. Don't treat it as something, you know, small. Don't, don't remember the enormity of Christ's sacrifice for you. Use the means of grace that we've talked about before to, to keep that in your mind, in your memory. Don't forsake assembling together. Matthew touched on last week. Uh, 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 you know, hold that as an important thing. Hold breaking of bread as an important thing. Prayer, Bible study. If you do those things, if you give your, as Isaac Watts puts it, your soul, your life, your all to Jesus Christ, then you will not be troubled by these these verses. They will not be a worry to you because you will be living for Christ and not living uh, in, 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 in a way of pleasing your flesh. You'll be pleasing him.